Good evening, everyone. Um, and I am coming to you from Capitol Hill. And I want to thank the Department of Health and Human Services for giving me an office to broadcast from. You can't see it, but I got the Capitol right behind me. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. And that is Dr. Teresa Sparks. She's an associate professor at the University of California, San Francisco. She's a specialist in both maternal fetal medicine and clinical genetics. In her clinical practice, Dr. Sparks cares for individuals through the Prenatal Diagnosis Center and the Fetal Treatment Center, um, patients who are pregnant or considering pregnancy, particularly those who are at higher risk due to fetal birth defects, fetal genetic diseases, and maternal genetic as well as non-genetic diseases. She's also the program director for the Maternal Fetal Medicine Fellowship at UCSF, and she's an active mentor for many postgraduate students, residents, and fellows. In her role as a physician scientist, Dr. Sparks oversees an active NICHD funded research program that is focused on non-immune hydrops fetalis, and that's what she's going to be speaking about today. She's an investigator, in the UCSF Center for Maternal Fetal Precision Medicine. So a perfect speaker for the Center for Precision Health Research at NHGRI. She's also the co-director of the NICHD funded Women's Reproductive Health Research or the WERHER K-12 program at UCSF. And she's the alternate PI for the NICHD funded Maternal Fetal Medicine Units Network Award at UCSF. Her overall research goals, which she'll be talking about today, are to uncover the full breadth of genetic diseases that underlie non-immune hydrops fetalis. And she's also interested in characterizing genotype-phenotype relationships for genetic diseases that present in the fetal period. She's also aiming to develop a precision-based approach to care for non-immune hydrops fetalis and other fetal anomalies and it, she is working towards the development of novel in utero treatment approaches for fetal genetic diseases. So as I said, a perfect speaker for the Center for Precision Health Research. So without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Teresa Sparks. Thank you so much, Dr. Bianchi, for that really kind introduction. It's really such an honor to present today about our research program, and I'm so grateful to the NHGRI, um, as well as for the, to the NICHD for the opportunity to present today and for the funding that enables us to do this work. Um, this talk will focus on our ongoing research to understand the genetic etiologies underlying non-immune high drops. I have no disclosures, although I will just say, and I shared this with Dr. Bianchi before I started, I am getting over um, now my fifth round of COVID um, with underlying asthma and I'm struggling with some ongoing pulmonary symptoms. So I may pause a few times just to catch my breath. Um, so bear with me if I need to do that. So hydrops, what is hydrops? We there's many terms that are used um, to describe hydrops. They include things like immune hydrops fetalis, non-immune hydrops fetalis. I'm just going to describe overall what we're talking about here, and then we'll go into some more details about non-immune hydrops in particular. So hydrops is diagnosed when fetal effusions are identified in the fetal body, as you see on some of the ultrasound pictures here. And so Sorry, this is what I mean about catching my breath, apologies. Um, we see a pleural effusion here. This is a cross section of the fetal abdomen. And you see here that there's fluid in the fetal chest cavity and the fetal lung and the heart are pushed off to the side. And then here in this picture, we see a pericardial effusion, which is a four chamber view of the fetal heart. And surrounding that, you can see that sliver of fluid I'm pointing now at ascites, if everybody can see this. That is the picture here that shows a side view of the fetal abdomen. And you can see here that there are intra-abdominal organs, and then there's fluid in the fetal abdomen where there should not be. And then in the lower picture, <clears throat> there's skin edema. And so you can see a cross-section of the fetal head 
there's the fulcs that's running through the middle. You can see the sutures and the fetal skull. And then surrounding the fetal head, you can see the skin edema, which is pretty pronounced. Okay, so here in the right top picture, you see placentomegaly, which is an enlarged size of the placenta. And then you also see polyhydramnios, which is an increased amount of amniotic fluid. And placentomegaly and polyhydramnios are often seen in association with high drops, but they're not technically one of the formal diagnostic criteria. And then finally here, we have a few other pictures to help us understand the spectrum. Um, these are typically earlier fetal effusions. We see, for example, an increased nuchal translucency that is something that we can detect in the first trimester when we're doing typically what has historically been referred to as the nuchal translucency ultrasound. Um, and it's again, I wish I could point to this, I'm so sorry, but it's the, if you can see here at the bottom, you see the fetal profile in that right upward picture. And then um, underneath at the back of the neck, you see a, a fluid dark space there that's a fluid filled space and you see the, the skin edge that is underlying. And then in the bottom right picture, we see a cystic hygroma. And this is sort of uh, along the same spectrum as nuchal translucency, but it can often be more complex as we see in the picture here. And so off to the left on that picture is actually the fetal head. And then behind that are all of these cystic areas where we see multiloculated collections that are typically referred to as a cystic hygroma. And I'm going to describe all of these features in a little bit more detail over the course of the talk. So hydrops is a serious diagnosis that carries significant risks for the fetus and for the pregnant individual. There's unfortunately a pretty high risk of in utero demise as well as death after birth if the fetus survives through the pregnancy. There's also risk to the pregnant person of developing preeclampsia, which is high blood pressure in pregnancy that can damage end organs, including the liver, kidneys, and brain. And I mentioned a few minutes ago the different types of hydrops. The less common type now is <clears throat> immune hydrops. And where Rogam is readily available, the incidence of immune hydrops is low currently. Um, and what that means is that immune hydrops results from alloimmunization, which is essentially incompatibilities between the fetal and maternal blood cells. And what we're going to focus on over the course of this talk is instead non-immune hydrops, which today, again, when Rogam is available, um, represents about 90% of cases of hydrops. So it's the vast majority of cases of hydrops. And non-immune hydrops results from really a multitude of genetic, viral, and many other etiologies. We've learned from emerging research in the last few years that an even greater spectrum of genetic diseases underlie non-immune hydrops than were previously understood. And this talk will focus, again, primarily on the genetic etiologies of non-immune hydrops. For those who might be interested in the history of the term hydrops, it appears that this word dates back to approximately 1700. It was derived from the Greek word dropsy, which came from the word for water. The term evolved from hydropsy to the dropsy to dropsy and then hydrops. And again, as you probably have a sense from some of my earlier slides, hydrops can be a pretty devastating diagnosis for families. This quote is from a patient who we interviewed about her experience of having a pregnancy complicated by high drops. Her fetus unfortunately demised in utero, so she had a stillbirth, and these are her reflections. <clears throat> they told me usually when babies have these types of things, they don't make it into their second trimester. Well, closer to the end of the second trimester, they said that she actually made it longer than she was supposed to. They did say that sometimes babies can be born with it, but then they don't last too long after that. So I'm glad that it happened the way it did happen, because I think it would have been way more impact if I would have physically went full term with her and then gave birth to her and then she just passed. I think that would be a very traumatic experience. So when I talk about high drops and I present this to my patients as a big picture view and often to trainees when I'm talking about what high drops means. I talk about high drops being the common endpoint of a really large number of potential underlying etiologies, many of which can present very similarly in terms of what we see on ultrasound, which makes it really difficult to differentiate among the possible causes. 
In this analogy here, many roads lead to the same place or common endpoint of fetal effusions or high drops. However, there is more to the story. It is essential to obtain further details of each case beyond simply there's high drops or there's lots of abnormal fluid in order to develop the appropriate testing strategy and identify the underlying diagnosis whenever possible. So let's take a moment and focus on the current approach to genetic testing for non-immune high drops in clinical practice today. When new cases of fetal effusions or non-immune high drops are diagnosed, standard evaluations are recommended to evaluate for genetic abnormalities, viral infections, and also structural or placental anomalies that can lead to the fetal effusions. Generally, a genetic etiology is identified in less than one quarter of cases after standard evaluations, including microarray and or karyotype, and viral infections generally explain less than 10% of all cases. It's important to clarify that even when a structural anomaly, such as a cardiac defect or a congenital diaphragmatic hernia is identified in the fetus and is felt to be related to the high drops or is sometimes felt to be causative of the high drops, there's still more investigation to be done because the congenital defect itself is still not explained. And there's a multitude of potential underlying genetic disorders to explain both the underlying congenital defect and the fetal effusions or high drops. Over the past few years, exome sequencing has been applied more and more in the prenatal setting to understand the etiologies of a variety of fetal abnormalities. As you all know, exome sequencing evaluates the protein coding regions of the genome and takes a broader look than is possible with what are currently standard of care tests for non-immune high drops with gene panels, karyotype, or microarray. Exome sequencing has been reported to identify a genetic etiology in approximately 8 to 30% of all fetal anomalies that are otherwise unexplained, and the diagnostic yield varies according to the underlying anomaly. For example, genitourinary anomalies and neural tube defects have shown relatively low diagnostic yields, while skeletal dysplasias and non-immune high drops have generally shown higher yields. And genome sequencing, rather than exome sequencing, has only recently become introduced in the prenatal setting, mostly in the setting of research studies, at least in the prenatal space. While the incremental yield of genome sequencing over exome sequencing in the clinical space deserves further study, preliminary papers suggest a small incremental yield currently. And this, I think, highlights the need for a better understanding of the breadth of etiologies of non-immune hydrops that includes rare viruses, but that also includes other genomic explorations and understanding the non-coding regions of the genome, epigenetics, and other potential contributors. Many patients who are faced with non-immune high drops and other fetal anomalies want information though, and that is information beyond the standard of care tests. And we see a lot of patients that are referred to our center because our ongoing studies provide access to exome or genome sequencing that they cannot otherwise obtain. Many insurance companies at this time still do not provide coverage for this testing, despite now many papers describing the diagnostic yield and the importance of a diagnosis. This quote is from one of our study participants who reflected on her desire for information as she also thought about future reproduction. There was the thickness, which is the high drops that was everywhere around the baby. I don't think she's going to survive. I learned it's really hard to have the baby survive through the pregnancy if I find out about the high drops at a very early stage. It's very low chance, but there is some hope, I will say. I think the worst case is going to be if they cannot find anything wrong. I'm going to figure out what's going on and at least help me narrow down not having another pregnancy loss in the future. So our research group is dedicated to understanding the genetic etiologies of non-immune high drops, as you've gathered from what I've presented so far, and we now have nearly a decade of experience with our research group with exploring non-immune high drops in this space. We have referred to our research program as high drops um, and came up with this acronym during a fun brainstorming session, which stands for high drops, diagnosing and redefining outcomes with precision studies. 
And our goals are those that are here, which are to identify the breadth of genetic diseases underlying non-immune hydrops, uncover the unique ways in which fetuses present in utero with a genetic disease leading to non-immune hydrops, improve our understanding of non-immune hydrops across diverse populations, and develop novel approaches to treating and managing pregnancies with a fetal genetic disease that can lead to high drops. And we'll talk about each of these areas in a little bit more depth throughout this presentation. So as we have studied non-immune high drops, we have, be, we have started to recognize that while high drops is typically diagnosed when two or more fetal effusions or abnormal fluid collections are identified on ultrasound, Single effusions, such as just fluid in the abdomen or just skin edema, may also develop into non-immune high drops. And importantly, from a diagnostic perspective, many of the same genetic diseases underlie both single effusions and non-immune high drops with multiple effusions. For example, rasopathies, such as Noonan or Costello syndrome, are well known to present with increased nuchal translucency in the first trimester which is again, that enlarged space at the back of the fetal neck that I hope everybody saw that I, the cursor wasn't working, but it's again, that profile view with the thickened space at the back of the fetal neck. But rasopathies can also present differently with isolated pleural effusions, or in other cases with florid non-immune high drops with multiple fetal effusions. And similarly, inborn errors of metabolism can present with just fluid in the abdomen or with fluorid non-immune high drops with multiple fetal effusions. There's many other interesting patterns that are emerging in terms of the timing, number, and types of fetal effusions, and our research aims to understand this spectrum better. Our preliminary high drops <clears throat> cohort was focused on understanding the yield of exome sequencing for unexplained cases of non-immune high drops. It turned out to be incredibly eye-opening in terms of understanding the breadth of diseases underlying non-immune high drops and the ways in which they present, which was previously not understood. I'm just, sorry, I'm having an issue with the slides here. Okay. Um, so over a three-year period, we enrolled pregnancies from across the country for exome sequencing after standard of care tests did not provide an explanation for the non-immune high drops. So that includes the standard of care recommendations as recommended by the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine and from a genetic perspective, specifically a non-diagnostic karyotype or a microarray. We included cases with fluorid non-immune high drops, as well as those with single effusions or early enlarged nuchal translucency or cystic hygroma in order to better understand the spectrum of ways in which fetuses present with genetic diseases. We enrolled a total of 127 cases in this initial study. In 29% overall, we identified one or more pathogenic or likely pathogenic variant in the fetus following ACMG criteria for classification and reporting with an additional 9% of cases that had a variant of uncertain significance that was considered suspicious by the multidisciplinary genomic board that evaluated each case. We saw that nearly one third of cases, as you see in the yellow portion of the pie here, resulted from rasopathies such as Noonan and Costello syndrome and observed a wide range of additional genetic diseases, such as inborn errors of metabolism, musculoskeletal disorders, immunological disorders, and other lymphatic disorders, since resopathies, of course, are often considered along the lymphatic disorder spectrum. There were also many other categories of disorders, as you see in the pie chart here. It's important to note that among the cases with at least one pathogenic or likely pathogenic variant, many had clear phenotypic overlap of the associated disorder with non-immune high drops. And a great example of that is the rasopathy is very clear phenotypic overlap with the molecular diagnosis. While others did not have a clear phenotypic overlap, such as the syndromes that present primarily with neurodevelopmental delay. And for those that did not have a clear phenotypic overlap, the question remains, are we seeing a phenotypic expansion that perhaps we just didn't know about before? Or are these variants incidental diagnoses unrelated to the reason we did the testing in the first place? 
further research is needed to answer this question. This slide illustrates examples of specific genetic diseases identified in our cohort within the categories presented in the pie chart. For example, inborn errors of metabolism that we identified included GM1 gangliosidosis and mucopolysaccharidosis type 7. It is also important to note that 58% of the genetic variants we reported at the time were novel, meaning that they had not previously been reported in genomic databases or in the medical literature at the time we tested them. This reflects the incredible amount we have yet to learn about genetic abnormalities underlying fetal disease as we have only begun to apply broad sequencing approaches such as this in the prenatal space. To take an early look at some of the deep phenotyping and think about how the diagnostic yield might differ according to the underlying type of fetal effusion, we looked at this with our preliminary data and we're gonna delve a little bit deeper into the phenotyping piece of this later in the presentation. So considering the type of fetal effusion, the diagnostic yield of exome sequencing was highest for cases that had two or more effusions, as you see on the right-hand side of the screen, those two pictures on the rightmost side, where you see that the diagnostic yield was 34%, as well as for cases that presented with a big nuchal translucency or a cystic hygroma in the first trimester of the pregnancy that also had something else, meaning that they also had another fetal effusion, they also had another congenital anomaly, there was more to the story than just the increased nuchal translucency or cystic hygroma. And for those cases, the diagnostic yield was 31%. The yield was lowest, although not insignificant, for cases with a single effusion, as you see in the middle panel. For example, just pleural effusions or just ascites, the yield in those cases was 10%, and was lowest, although I would still say not insignificant, for cases that were isolated increased nuchal translucency or cystic hygroma, that was 7%, as you see on the lower left. This is another study that we published a couple of years ago, which we designed to answer the question, how many diagnoses would we have picked up if a gene panel had been sent instead of exome sequencing, and how many would have been missed? And we asked this question because gene panels are clinically more often covered by insurance for patients. Um, but as we all know, gene panels are limited by the select group of genes that are included and do not detect diseases outside of those genes. So we took all cases from the prior study I outlined that underwent exome sequencing and compared the genes implicated to those on available commercial gene panels. As you can see in the graph, detection rates if a panel had been used instead of exome sequencing varied from 11 to 62 percent, with higher yields from the hydrops gene panels, as you see on the left side of the figure, the yield was approximately two-thirds, um, and the lowest yield from the metabolic panel that is in the middle, which was 11 percent, and that metabolic panel focuses primarily on inborn errors of metabolism. And really what this highlights again is that we have so much to learn about the genetic contributions to fetal disease and hydrops in particular, and that broad testing ap approaches are really important to understand the many etiologies of non-immune hydrops. So then what is the impact of a genetic diagnosis with a pregnancy with hydrops and why does it matter? With such a broad array of potential underlying diagnoses, it is important to highlight that establishing a prenatal diagnosis can be hugely beneficial for patients and providers. Pregnancies with hydrops resulting from different genetic disorders can have widely different outcomes that are important to counsel families about. For example, a diagnosis of Costello syndrome is associated with developmental delays, some dysmorphic features, and risk of childhood and adult cancers. A diagnosis of mucopolysaccharidosis type 7, on the other hand, is associated with severe neurodevelopmental regression, musculoskeletal anomalies, and often early death. And when we have families in front of us with a new diagnosis of hydrops or with a known diagnosis of hydrops, really what they want to know from us is what are the postnatal expectations? They want to know what is the chance of survival? 
What is the chance of my child experiencing pain, comorbidities? What is their quality of life going to be? And many others. And these factors differ quite widely across different genetic diagnoses, despite many of them having nearly the exact same as it appears presentation in utero. So once a prenatal diagnosis is established, this allows for focused counseling based on the particular disease. It allows for development of disease-specific prenatal management plans for things like the frequency of fetal monitoring and eligibility for fetal interventions that are clinically available, as well as with clinical trials. Coordination of prenatal consultations from relevant subspecialists, so that way patients hear important information before they deliver and can inform expectations accurately. Planning for delivery with decisions such as comfort care or full resuscitation for the neonate. Development of plans for prompt initiation of neonatal treatments where available instead of waiting weeks for testing after birth. And informing expectations for recurrence risk in a future pregnancy. This case, I think, provides a nice illustration of the impact of a prenatal diagnosis. This was a 37-year-old patient who was referred to our study because of a cystic hygroma, skin edema, and pericardial effusion that were detected on routine ultrasound at 12 weeks of gestation. These fetal effusions resolved over subsequent weeks, although the nuchal space at the back of the neck remained thicker than anticipated. Amniocentesis was performed and microarray showed normal results. Her pregnancy was otherwise notable for the comorbidities that you see here. Now, because the microarray and other standard tests for non-immune high drops did not identify an explanation, we proceeded with exome sequencing. The exome sequencing results returned showing a de novo heterozygous pathogenic frame shift variant in RPL11 which is associated with diamond black fan anemia. Diamond black fan is associated with red cell aplasia, anemia, reticulocytopenia, growth restriction, and anomalies of multiple organ systems. Case reports existed of non-immune hydrops presenting in, in fetuses with diamond black fan anemia at the time, although this particular variant was novel and had not been previously reported in association with this disease. But now having this diagnosis, which made sense in the context of the fetal phenotype, the local obstetric team was able to put together a surveillance plan for fetal anemia and arranged subspecialty consultations to inform plans for neonatal management and provide information to the patient about expectations for her child. During the third trimester, middle cerebral artery dapplers, as you see in the pictures here, I wish I could point to it, I'm sorry that I can't, but you see the fetal head in the top picture here and the middle cerebral artery that's lighting up in that red color. And then below we see the velocity of that, those waveforms that tell us whether there's increased risk of fetal anemia. Um, An identification of, of increased risk for fetal anemia is really important because there are procedures that are available to confirm the diagnosis of anemia, transfuse a truly anemic fetus and prevent complications of untreated anemia, which include worsening high drops and ultimately stillbirth if untreated. Oh, just taking a moment to catch my breath. Thanks everybody for bearing with me. These procedures are percutaneous umbilical blood sampling and intrauterine transfusion, which are accomplished in a minimally invasive manner to deliver donor blood to an anemic fetus. Then at 32 weeks in this particular case, recurrence of the skin edema was noted along with new polyhydramnios, again, increased amount of amniotic fluid around the fetus. And so given these findings, the local team moved toward delivery and following a two month stay in the neonatal intensive care unit, this child was ultimately discharged. This case though highlights the benefits of an early diagnosis for informing the management of a really complicated pregnancy setting expectations for patients and families, avoiding unnecessary diagnostic odysseys after birth and developing early and focused perinatal treatment plans. And I think it's also important to remember that a genetic diagnosis can be healing, not only in the context of an ongoing pregnancy, but also for the purpose of closure after the fact. 
This participant was referred to our study because 20 years later, after having multiple pregnancy losses as a result of non-immune high drops, she still lacked an answer for why this happened until the exome sequencing was performed. This has been a grief that I have had for 20 years. I was just shocked that they still had sample. Oh my gosh, all these years, there's a legitimate answer now. I just can't put into words how I feel about that. I'm just very thankful for all the compassion that I've been shown through this journey of finding out the test results. My daughter, who is 21, is going to be tested too. So now, moving forward, our team is focused on the next phase of our research that we refer to as HYDROPS2, which is also funded by the NICHD. Our current research aims to understand the diagnostic yield of genome sequencing for fetuses with unexplained non-immune high drops, further characterize the breadth of single gene disorders underlying non-immune high drops through a large and diverse patient cohort, perform deep phenotyping to understand the unique fetal features of genetic diseases that present with non-immune high drops, and ultimately to use the knowledge we gain through this work to develop algorithms based on fetal features and how they evolve over gestation to predict the underlying genetic disease. To create the HYDROPS2 cohort, we selected four other centers across the country that perform frequent consultations for non-immune HYDROPS and have racial and ethnic diversity in their patient populations that enhances the overall diversity of the total cohort. We are still enrolling participants under this protocol, but I have preliminary results that I can share. Now, similar to the preliminary high drops protocol, we are including pregnancies with fluorid non-immune high drops with two or more fetal effusions, as well as those with just one fetal effusion, such as gestocytes, as well as those cases that have an early increased nuchal translucency or a cystic hygroma. We've enrolled 53 participants to date, and among these, 48 have results of genome sequencing that have returned. As you can see in the pie chart here, in 31%, one or more pathogenic or likely pathogenic variants were identified. In 6%, a suspicious variant of uncertain significance was identified, and in 63%, the results of genome sequencing were negative. And similar to the study that I presented much earlier in the presentation, looking at the incremental yield of genome sequencing over exome sequencing, I would say that so far the incremental yield that we are observing is small for non-immune high drops cases, which highlights again the need for further research to understand certainly more of the genetic contributions, whether those are in non-coding regions, candidate genes, or gene-gene interactions among others, as well as other etiologies of high drops, which probably include rare viruses and other etiologies. I think one thing that is important to note about the genome sequencing, though, is despite there being a relatively smaller incremental yield than anticipated, the turnaround time is much faster than exome sequencing, which is quite meaningful for patients who are facing really difficult decisions about how to manage their pregnancies and what to expect. And then importantly, 57% of participants in our HYDROPS2 cohort thus far are, are underrepresented in genomic research. And we are continuing to make efforts to maximize diversity and publish genetic variants from diverse populations. We are also collecting one-year postnatal outcomes for all survivors in order to better define the outcomes of non-immune HYDROPS in general, as well as of the genetic diseases that present in utero with non-immune HYDROPS. For example, we don't understand at present whether the long-term outcomes are different for surviving fetuses that have Noonan syndrome comparing those that do and do not present with non-immune high drops. Teresa, before you go to the next slide, um, uh, Francis Collins has a question for you. Absolutely. Do you always obtain genome sequence on the parents as well as the fetus? For those cases where you found a genetic cause, what's the distribution of de novo dominant mutations versus autosomal recessive? That's a really great question. So what we do with our testing approach is we typically, we it, it depends actually on the nuance of the situation. For 
pregnancies where we really need a result very quickly, we will, we will run trio genome sequencing. Um, for pregnancies where we have a little bit more leisure in terms of a turnaround time and what is needed for information, we sometimes run those as proband first, so we call it, which means that we sequence the, the fetus first, and if there are variants of interest, we then sequence the parents. Um, and to answer the second question, which is a really important one, you know, I would say that probably, and I could pull these numbers, but I would say my gestalt thinking about our data is that about two thirds of the cases ish are autosomal dominant. And then, you know, a, a, the vast majority of the remainder are autosomal recessive with a small proportion being X-linked. Um, and I think a lot of that stems from the rasopathy as being the most common diagnoses, as well as some of the skeletal dysplasias. Did that answer the question? Francis, do you want to come off mute or? It sounded like it was an appropriate answer. So I think you can let, go ahead. Let me know if not, I'm happy to come back. Um, okay, let's see. And this also might give a sense of building off of what we were just talking about here before. So here is the data that I pulled together from all of our prospectively enrolled non-immune high drops cases to better understand the big picture from a diagnostic perspective. So at this point, we've enrolled quite a large cohort considering high drops as a relatively rare diagnosis. We've now sequenced over 300 cases of non-immune high drops from across the country in total and have performed exome or genome sequencing for all of them. Among the 90 cases that you see here with at least one pathogenic or likely pathogenic variant, we see again that approximately one third of the cases, as you see in the blue proportion of the pie that are attributable to a rasopathy, Musculoskeletal disorders, such as skeletal dysplasias and myopathies, make up the next largest portion of the pie. Disorders that present primarily with intellectual disability, plus or minus other structural anomalies and comorbidities, make up 8%. And there's many other categories, as you see here, ranging from fetal anemias with or without lymphedema, primary lymphedema disorders, inborn errors of metabolism, et cetera. And these categorizations, I think, are a little tricky because there's some overlap, and I think I mentioned this earlier in the presentation, but for example, there's overlap among the rasopathies and primary lymphedema syndromes, which both involve lymphatic abnormalities, although we do see some phenotypic differences between them, as I'll show on later slides. And then, as I mentioned previously, for cases without a clear phenotypic overlap between what we're seeing on ultrasound or MRI and what we're seeing in terms of a molecular diagnosis, the question still remains is, are we seeing a phenotypic expansion that we didn't know about before? Or are these variants incidental diagnoses that are really unrelated, unrelated to the reason why we did the testing in the first place? And again, I think we need the benefit of time and further research to help us answer this question. For those who may be curious about the spectrum of diseases that we have identified in association with the pathogenic or likely pathogenic variants I presented, this slide gives an overview of a portion of them. There were too many to list on one slide though, again, highlighting the breadth of potential underlying genetic diagnoses when we diagnose high drops on an ultrasound. In addition to further research to further characterize the breadth of genetic diseases underlying non-immune high drops, I think one really fascinating area is further phenotyping to understand the unique ways in which fetuses manifest with genetic diseases. Ultrasound and MRI that are used in the prenatal setting are rapidly improving, and earlier identification of abnormalities is increasingly possible. However, we still lack clarity with respect to what we should expect to see in many fetuses with genetic diseases, when we should expect to see those features, and how the in utero features we identify might help us to predict the ultimate outcomes for that fetus or child. And there's important limitations of prenatal phenotyping that are important to understand. The first is that some phenotypes are not currently possible to identify in utero, such as hearing loss, vision loss, or seizures. And as I mentioned on the prior slide, we lack a clear understanding of how many genetic diseases present differently in a fetus as compared to a child or adult, 
which can limit our abilities to accurately arrive at a diagnosis in some cases. I like to use this analogy when I talk about non-immune high drops and some in the room or on the webinar may recognize these from Highlights Magazine that I used to look at with my kids when they were much younger and find the differences between the pictures. Um, but I think these pictures underscore the importance of looking deeper at each case of non-immune high drops because there's many subtleties when each case is examined carefully. On first glance, these pictures look quite similar, but after one spends the time to parse out the differences, it's clear that many differences exist. And this is how I think about high drops. What clues exist beyond just simply the presence of abnormal fluid to help us find a diagnosis? What effusions are present? When did they appear? What other abnormalities do we see? Is fetal growth affected? And many other such questions. So here I will provide some data that gives some examples of some of these subtleties over the next few slides. And again, this is using data from all of our prospectively collected non-immune hydrox cases. Again, the, the resopathies are the most common group of disorders underlying um, non-immune hydrox as we have seen. And we see many of the fetal phenotypes listed here that tend to present with resopathies when they also present in utero with hydrops. So particularly common for the resopathies are increased nuchal translucency or cystic hygroma in the first trimester, and then also pleural effusions, ascites, skin edema, jugular sacs, which I haven't mentioned yet. These are distended lymphatics in the fetal neck that we can see in the ultrasounds, typically in the first and second trimesters, cardiac anomalies, renal abnormalities, and interestingly, contractures of the extremities, which involve the arms, legs, hands or feet being in a sort of fixed, flexed or extended, but fixed position. And then of course, polyhydramnios. And you know some of these features like the pleural effusions and the polyhydramnios are well published as fetal features of the resopathies, but others really are not. And examples of those are fetal contractures, a small or absent appearance of the fetal stomach, and fetal arrhythmias. And so certainly we need to get more of this data out there to really understand the unique ways that fetuses present in utero. And of course, just to note too, that many of the features of rasopathies that we think about after birth, some of the dysmorphic features we can pick up in utero, many of them, unfortunately, we will miss. And of course, things like learning challenges or developmental delays, we ha don't have the ability to predict in utero. And so here, what we're trying to do is take a little bit of a different approach than just simply describing the overall phenotypes as I showed on the prior slide. Here, we have instead mapped out the gestational age at which each phenotype is observed with each phenotypic feature on the y-axis and the gestational age on the x-axis. This view, I think, is important for us to understand not just what, what might be seen in general with the rasopathies, but also when in gestation we might expect to see certain phenotypes. So, for example, a big nuchal translucency, which is, again, that space at the back of the fetal neck, presents in the first trimester, typically. I wish I could show you all um, with my cursor. I'm so sorry that I can't. But if you can look midway through the graph, you see the increased nuchal translucency um, about halfway down that presents primarily in the first trimester um, as compared to cystic hygroma that can persist, which is that line just below increased nuchal translucency. Cystic hygroma can present in the first trimester but can continue into the second trimester. And then there's other features like macrocephaly, which is a large head size, polyhydramnios, or a visually smaller absent stomach that tend to be features observed more so in the third trimester while other features like contractures and renal abnormalities are more so observed throughout gestation. So these are really interesting patterns. And to my knowledge, there's really not much out there that has been published taking this kind of a lens with this approach to phenotyping over time. That is really um, an area that I think is really important to publish to help us from a diagnostic perspective in the prenatal space. And then another approach to deep phenotyping that we are exploring is um, understanding the features that tend to co-occur with each other for particular categories of diseases. So the lighter blue here indicates greater frequency, while the darker blues indicate lower frequency. For the resopathies, we can see that some of the features that tend to co-occur are polyhydramnios with pleural effusions, 
polyhydramnios with skin edema, and pleural effusions with renal abnormalities. And again, understanding the fetal features of each disease category underlying non-immune hydrops in more detail is a step forward, not only to better characterizing their unique presentations over time, but also toward developing confidence in a diagnosis and even disease prediction algorithms. These really help us, for example, when we have a variant of uncertain significance that is identified on exome or genome sequencing, and when we have a really good understanding of the phenotype and what we might expect to see, it gives us more confidence in deciding how to adjudicate that variant. Importantly, further data and numbers of cases will also be required to understand nuanced genotype-phenotype correlations on a deeper level than by disease category, which again will just require many more cases, even more than, than those that we've amassed so far. And here I'll briefly show some observations for other disease categories over the next couple of slides. For these, we're also pursuing additional deep phenotyping methods as I've outlined for the rasopathies. So for the primary lymphedema disorders, these are also conditions, of course, that involve abnormal lymphatics. However, there's some differences when we look at these in comparison to the rasopathies. So the primary lymphedema disorders typically present with fewer congenital anomalies, such as cardiac defects that are seen with the rasopathies, but like the rasopathies, common fetal features of primary lymphedema disorders appear to be increased nuchal translucency or cystic hygroma in the first trimester, pleural effusions, ascites, skin edema, and polyhydramnios. Inborn errors of metabolism, interestingly, most frequently present with ascites and skin edema, so different fluid collections than we saw with the prior categories of diseases, followed next by pericardial effusion and pleural effusions. They also manifest with an increased nuchal fold, which is similar to the increased nuchal translucency that I showed early on in the first trimester. This is now sort of a thickened appearance of the skin at the back of the neck that we typically see in the second trimester. They can also present with cardiac anomalies, renal abnormalities, contractures, and interestingly, oligohydramnios, which is now low amniotic fluid in comparison to the polyhydramnios and increased amniotic fluid that we see with the other disorders. This pattern of features is distinct from the other categories of, the, of diseases that we saw on prior slides, and I'm really interested to see how this looks as we gain more cases. And then finally, this one I think is just really interesting. The disorders that present primarily with intellectual disability, like we discussed previously, it remains really uncertain whether these are incidental diagnoses or whether these are truly related to the fetal effusions given the clear lack of clear phenotypic overlap based on what we understand presently. However, it is notable that the vast majority present early on with increased nuchal translucency or cystic hygroma and the other common features were skin edema and increased nuchal fold. And again, this pattern of features is distinct from those seen with other categories of disorders that we've seen on prior slides and merits further investigation, certainly with long-term follow-up. I took this picture and I think this, I, I'm always thinking about high drops with our research. And so when we were in New Zealand a few months ago, I took this picture of these really, really clear, beautiful springs. And the springs are known for the clarity of the water, the volume of the water discharged, and their spiritual significance. And when I was looking at this, I was thinking that my hope someday is there is as much clarity as we see in these springs with what causes high drops and how we give the best care to our patients and ultimately treat it in utero. Until then, we have a lot of work to do, but we're getting there. I'm watching the time and I'm almost done. Um, I'll end with a few slides here. This one, I just, I'm immensely grateful to my patients and participants in our studies. This quote highlights the pull that many of our patients going through such complicated pregnancies feel to participate in research and not only learn about their own situation, but also contribute to the greater good. I mean, I think certainly I'm curious if there is something more to be known, but I don't think that's my primary reason for doing this because we're not going to try again. So it's not to see if this is going to happen again. I can't do this again. So I think just to give back, I love that it's mostly women and that you take care of women at a time when it's getting harder and harder to take care of women and for us to take care of ourselves, each other. I'll finish with a few notes about the clinical translations of our research program. 
We have been really fortunate to translate the knowledge that we have gained through our research program toward the development of a HIDROP Center of Excellence at UCSF. Our vision with the Center of Excellence is to be a national resource for patients and providers to obtain equitable access to cutting edge diagnostics, expert clinical care, and novel in utero therapies to optimize the outcomes for continuing pregnancies with non-immune hydrops. Through the Hydrop Center of Excellence, we're able to offer multidisciplinary clinical care to patients whose pregnancies are complicated by non-immune hydrops. We work really closely with other perinatologists, radiologists, um, neonatologists, surgeons, many others who work with us to develop really comprehensive and thoughtful disease-focused treatment plans for our patients. Through the Genomic Medicine Laboratory, we're able to provide exome and genome sequencing for patients that otherwise would not have access because of the high cost and often the lack of insurance coverage. We meet with the Multidisciplinary Genome Board on a weekly basis to adjudicate variants that we identify in our patients through an iterative process that's informed by both the laboratory perspective and the clinician perspective. We offer telehealth consultations for patients who are unable to travel to UCS and are fortunately able to perform these consultations for patients across the country who don't have the means to travel to San Francisco and see us. We also collaborate with other researchers to develop novel in utero therapies for continuing pregnancies with non-immune high drops. Examples are a clinical trial that is currently recruiting patients for the administration of in utero enzyme replacement therapy in hopes of mitigating the many adverse outcomes associated with inborn errors of metabolism and non-immune high drops, as well as another project that I'm very involved with, which is understanding whether MEK inhibitors might have the potential to ameliorate the severe phenotypes that are associated with resopathies that present with non-immune high drops. And so thinking forward, there's a mountain of work to do, but it's exciting to see how far we've come and what's on the horizon. In the future, we aim to complete the characterization of the full breadth of genetic diseases underlying non-immune high drops, more fully characterize the unique fetal phenotypes of genetic diseases that underlie non-immune high drops, develop disease prediction algorithms based on fetal phenotypes and their evolution across gestation, study non-coding regions, candidate genes, many other potential contributions for those cases that remain negative, that's 63% overall, that still remain negative based on what we've seen so far, and develop focused perinatal management plans that are specific to genetic diseases and have an eye toward the development of novel disease-focused and utero treatments for our patients that choose to continue their pregnancies with non-immune high drops. With that, I would like to say thank you so much to Dr. Diana Bianchi, the NHGRI, and the NICHD. I also want to say thank you so much, of course, to our wonderful research teams, our divisions and departments at UCSF, and the funding that makes our research possible, including from the NICHD, and absolutely, of course, to the patients and families who participate in our research. I've included some pictures here. These are our two top pictures here that you see are our research teams. If you can see in that right upward picture to my son is an honorary member of our research team who often comes to our research meetings. We have our wonderful MFM division who is pictured in the bottom middle picture. My wonderful fellows who are in the bottom right who always humble me and inspire me. And then my wonderful family in the bottom left who are a continued source of support. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions and thank you again so much. Thank you so much, Teresa. That was fantastic. And especially considering that you are not feeling well and you had to pause to, to get a breath. Um, Thank you for bearing I, with me. <laughs> I did hear from Dr. Collins that you did answer his question. And I believe the question and answers are uh, popping up right now. And I realized that um, because of the webinar format, people can't unmute. So it took me a while to, to figure that out. Uh, the first question is from Stephen Solar. Great talk, he said. Was wondering if you've tried to call structural variants from the short read data, and if you think that you could solve some of the still unknown cases. Semi-related, do you think it's possible to get DNA fragments large enough to attempt fetal hi-fi? Oh, those are such great questions. And I think exactly in line with what we're thinking next. With what we have been doing so far, as you probably gathered from the talk, we've really been focused on 
understanding the clinical yields of the genome, exome and genome sequencing that we've been doing. And a lot of that has been because we're able to then deliver results back to our patients who so desperately want that information. And it really helps the providers as well. But I 100% agree with you. These are questions that are exactly all along the lines of the next steps of our research, because, you know, we have all of these all of these samples that, you know, over 300 cases that I'm so excited to analyze from a research perspective to answer some of these questions. Great. Thank you. There's another question um, in the box from Andang Do. She says, thank you for sharing your work. Please excuse that I don't have the option to turn on my camera and un unmute myself. And also, if I missed this from your presentation. So the question is, does the exome sequencing data set you have generate generated provide sufficient power for analyses of either dye or multigenic contributions or modifiers? That is also a fantastic question. That's actually what we are starting to look into right now with some collaborators with next steps for grant applications that are coming up. So stay tuned for the answer to that question. Great. Um, I, I had a question. I think another one may be popping up, but um, I wonder if as a result of making a diagnosis on the percentage of, of uh, fetuses, have you gone back or are people looking particularly at the fathers because the mothers are under clinical care and they are being examined more frequently, but have you been able to, for example, identify fathers with Noonan syndrome? That's also a really great question. I didn't have time to get into this with the slides. What I think is really interesting actually with the rasopathies that we've seen, um, including Noonan syndrome, is that the vast majority that present with high drops are de novo. Out of all of the cases, we've had two that I can think of that were inherited and the rest were de novo. Um, and so, you know, certainly some of those variants, actually most of the variants have been previously reported. And so that I think is such a fascinating question about you know, why does this fetus with this genetic variant that otherwise we would pick up in a child or adult, why are they presenting so severely with high drops and what else is there to the story? Totally agree. Okay, and then we have Les Biesecker asking the following question. It seems like there would be a decent number of cases where you need a genetic answer as soon as possible. Who are you using for the sequencing and what is your turnaround time? Thank you for asking that question. I'm just confirming you can hear me because Dr. Bianchi looks frozen on my screen. We can hear you. Okay, perfect. Um, we do the sequencing in-house at UCSF. So our genomic medicine laboratory does the exome and genome sequencing for our cases. We've actually transitioned now to really doing primarily genome sequencing. Um, one, because we really want to explore those cases and the data from a research perspective, as we've talked about before, but really because the turnaround time is much faster, like I had mentioned earlier in the presentation. For our patients with ongoing pregnancies that really need an answer very quickly, we usually quote a turnaround time of two to three weeks for the genome sequencing. And for pregnancies that, again, we have a little bit more leisure of time, we usually tell patients it's more on the order of four to eight weeks. So that way we have room to prioritize the truly stat cases. Great. Um... It is six o'clock, so I need to sign off. But Les, are you able to pick up? There are a couple more questions now. Um, I can't see the questions, though. Uh, okay, so questions. let me read them. Juan Mo asked, has optic genome mapping, OGM, been used in this field? That is a great question. It has really not been introduced in the prenatal space. I think there are some papers that are coming out confirming you all can hear me. I'm so sorry. I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. There are some papers that are coming out suggesting potential utility of OGM in the prenatal space, but clinically it's really not used. Great. Okay. So we're going to make this the last question and that's from Lori Bonnie Castle. She says, thanks. That was a great presentation of your very significant and impactful work. I can't remember the number of exome sequence individuals in your study, but do you expect the rate of newly identified variants to decrease, that is, plateau, for your population? If yes, would it help to make new ethnic-specific gene panels incorporating newly identified variants? This could increase the diagnostic yield of the gene pa panels 
to be comparable to whole exome sequencing and be more acceptable for insurance coverage and perhaps provide faster turnaround? Such a great question too. So it's it's interesting that you asked that because the paper that I presented earlier where we had compared the yield with panels to, to exome sequencing, it was really interesting because while we were writing the paper, actually as we were working on the revisions for that paper, one of the commercial companies updated their gene panel to include all of the genes from our preliminary paper. And so all of a sudden the yield went from two thirds to hundred um, percent, which was a, is really interesting to see that. Um, I do think that they seem very on top, I will say from my experience with updating the gene panels, but um, it's a great question. And I think the earlier one that you asked too is important. And I think about this a lot with the cases that we're seeing with our ongoing study. We are certainly seeing repeats of some of the diagnoses that we identified originally, but we're also seeing completely new diagnoses that we didn't see in the first 300 cases. And so we're, we're pressing forward for the time being to really gather as much data as we can. Well, I think that's a great way to end the discussion. Um, we can provide Dr. Sparks' email address if you have additional questions. But again, we really want to thank you uh, for a, just a terrific talk. I also want to thank the AV staff who allowed us to facilitate this uh, hybrid presentation. And uh, it's really exciting to know how much more we're learning about the fetus. You know, it's not just about anatomic findings that are detected through ultrasound anymore. We are learning a lot more and it's also changing our knowledge of the natural history of so many single gene disorders. So you are contributing a huge amount in that area. So thank you. Um, thank you everybody, so take care and uh, we will have another seminar in two weeks.